There's a strange moment in military history where necessity pushed soldiers to outthink the landscape itself. Picture the North African front of World War II. Relentless winds, shifting dunes, and nights so cold they stripped heat straight from the body. Standard tents, even the rugged canvas military models, simply weren't enough. They rattled, collapsed, tore, and buried themselves in blowing sand. Yet, in the middle of this harsh environment, small groups of field engineers and reconnaissance units developed a pole layout system so stable that it outperformed tents entirely. It wasn't fabric they improved, it was structure. They created a framework that used wind against itself, turning the desert's greatest enemy into a stabilizing force. By the time you finish this guide, you'll understand how that system worked, why it was superior to canvas shelters, and how you can use the same principles today for survival shelters, backcountry camps, or historical experiments. The foundation of the World War II pole layout was understanding wind behavior instead of fighting it outright. The soldiers who engineered this system weren't trying to create a sealed, warm tent. Their priority was stability. They had watched tents fail repeatedly because their design acted like a sail. Canvas caught the wind and converted it into destructive force. The breakthrough came when they realized that poles, not fabric, should be the main structural element. Instead of suspending canvas, they built low, aerodynamic frameworks using interlocked poles driven deep into the sand. These poles were arranged in angled patterns, leaning into the direction of prevailing winds. This meant that instead of resisting the wind, the framework redirected it downward into the sand, anchoring itself. Modern shelter builders sometimes relearn this the hard way. If you've ever camped in high wind regions, you know that tensioned fabric fails before the frame does. By shifting to a pole-first architecture, the World War II engineers created a shelter that let wind slip through or over it instead of pushing directly against it. The key was the tripod and ridge sequence that created a stable skeleton unaffected by sudden gusts. One of the most effective field configurations involved starting with two tripods built of long, sturdy poles. Tripods don't twist, they don't fold, and they don't rely on soil quality. Even in loose sand, a properly planted tripod sinks deeper with force rather than being pulled out. Soldiers spaced these tripods about two metres apart and connected them with a horizontal ridge pole. This ridge became the backbone of the shelter. The secret wasn't just the tripods, it was the angle of the legs. Instead of placing the tripod legs vertically, they leaned them outward so each leg formed a wide triangle with the ground. This broadened the base and lowered the center of gravity. It also allowed wind to pass between the legs instead of striking a single solid wall. Once the ridge was in place, additional poles were leaned up against one side, forming a sloped, wind-facing surface that acted like the shell of a small wooden hut. You can replicate this structure easily today. Set up two or three tripods, space them evenly, connect them with a ridge, then build slanted walls by leaning long poles against the windward side. Cover it only if needed. The framework alone stands firm even in dangerous gusts. Most tents die when sand builds around their guy lines or buries their lower edges. The World War II pole layout embraced sand instead of resisting it. Soldiers noticed that windblown sand naturally piled on the slanted side of their structure. Instead of weakening it, this sand 
acted like weight on a roof, pushing the poles deeper and compacting the base. The trick was leaving enough gaps for airflow. Unlike a fabric tent which tries to be airtight, the pole system functioned like a desert animal's hide, porous enough to avoid pressure build-up, but shaped to redirect force. As sand accumulated, the shelter became more stable, effectively rooting itself into the landscape. To apply this principle today, especially in windy or sandy terrain, avoid fully sealed walls. Use slanted surfaces and allow sand to settle naturally. This transforms an unstable campsite into a semi-fixed, wind-resistant base. People often assume a shelter must block all wind, but this is only true in mild climates. In deserts, airflow is essential. Without it, heat builds under canvas until the interior becomes unbearable. The World War II pole layout allowed steady controlled airflow under the slanted roof and between the angled support poles. At night, when desert temperatures plunged, the sand-packed base and the slanted roof created a pocket of still air close to the ground, trapping body heat. This wasn't comfort in the modern sense, but it was survival-grade climate control. Soldiers slept shielded from direct wind while still benefiting from circulation. Any modern desert traveller or survivalist can replicate this advantage by using pole structures instead of a fully enclosed tent. A simple pole skeleton with a light tarp draped loosely over the leeward side will outperform a tightly pitched tent in many desert conditions. The World War II pole layout shows that structure matters more than fabric in extreme environments. The brilliance of this shelter wasn't a material breakthrough. It was engineering insight. A pole-first wind-shaped layout created a stable base, allowed sand deposition to help rather than harm, and offered airflow that prevented heat buildup. When covering was needed, using canvas, ponchos, netting, or even brush, it was purely secondary. The structure was what made survival possible. If you want to experiment with this technique today, start by constructing the skeleton without fabric. Build a tripod and ridge system, lean poles at an angle, and walk around it during a windy moment. You'll feel the difference immediately. The structure redirects the wind rather than blocking it. Add a covering only after the frame feels self-supporting. The deeper we look into World War II field engineering, the more we uncover methods that outsmarted the harshest landscapes using nothing but geometry, timing and resourcefulness. If this guide gave you new insight into forgotten shelter-building strategies, make sure you subscribe to In the Beginning and share this breakdown with fellow history enthusiasts and survival-minded viewers.